Hi everyone, welcome to tonight's discussion with Kenny Watt. Um, tonight's discussion is on athlete recovery methods. Um, this is part of our Player Education Month. Um, so we have a series of topics over the course of the month and we're going to start this month with uh, Kenny Watt. Uh, for those of you who know Kenny, you know that he's been involved in volleyball for a long time. So without further ado, let's bring Kenny onto the screen. Evening. Hi, Kenny. How are you doing? How's your day? Uh, good, good, yeah. The sun's been out a little bit on sporadically here in Linlithgow, so uh, we got a bit outside and then forced inside at bits as well, uh, and keeping two children entertained as well at the same time. Fantastic. Uh, so, Kenny, just as a, a start, could you just give us a background of your achievements of being a physio and how you became a physio, etc.? Sure. Um, so I graduated in 2009 uh, from Teesside. Uh, I initially did a couple of years in the NHS uh, and then I, from the NHS went into private practice in Edinburgh. Uh, since then, I, I, I remain in private practice in Edinburgh now at Space Clinics uh, up in Dalry Road. Um, alongside the private practice work, uh, I was always interested in working in sports and so, to some extent. And that initially took me as my first kind of major sporting event was the World University Games in 2009 uh, in Belgrade. Uh, I followed that on then with another World University Games in Kazan in 2013 in Russia, uh, 2015 in Guangzhou and South Korea, and then 2017 Taipei uh, was my last game, so World University Games. Uh, and alongside that, in 2018, I went on to do the Commonwealth Games with Team Scotland. Uh, where, where I covered beach volleyball, uh, powerlifting, weightlifting, and then a little bit of basketball uh, alongside that as well. So, so yeah, day to day private patients, private clinic, um, with with us kind of sporting ten, twins to it, and then alongside that some multi sport games ex work as well, and then and as you say volleyball. Excellent. So, when and how did you get involved in the volleyball side of things? Uh, so I, I, like a lot of people, I, the only volleyball kind of experience I had was in high school uh, doing PE. But <clears throat> in 2009, when I went to Belgrade for my first World University Games, I was actually I, I just a graduated student physiotherapist. Uh, and at that Games, Team GB had taken a, a volleyball team along, um, which was filled with players who were, who were likely to go on to, do, to compete in 2012 in London. Uh, so it was, in essence, a, a chance to put some players together and give them a run out. Uh, and uh, that was Joel Banks, who you, you had on, was the coach at that time, and then one of his assistants was uh, Simon Loftus, or Lofty. Uh, and I spent some of the time in Belgrade with, with the volleyball, uh, alongside my, my, my friend Stephen, who was, who was looking after them primarily, uh, and he just got on very well with Simon, and on returning from Belgrade, he approached me and said, at the time he'd taken over, I think he'd not long taken over the Scotland job, uh, and was looking to appoint a physio. And so I, I came on board, again, still not long being graduated and, and still not really known well, very much, to be honest. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so since 2009, then it's just really been a, a kind of constant learning experience. Uh, and so, yeah, so it, it was via Lofty, in essence. And, and since then, we've gone through a number of coaches uh, and he's left and, I, and I've kind of stayed involved. Uh, and my role has expanded in time. It just was, you know, turning up at the odd game and the odd event initially and doing little bits and pieces to now, you know, what we'll, what we'll see tonight, hopefully, I kind of expand the role with widening scope. Yeah, so just a little bit of a coincidence that we've had yourself, Lofty and Joe Banks on over the last couple of weeks, which has been quite good. Yeah, so, it's been good. So, so guys, just in case anybody's got any questions, um, if you just put your questions in the comments box, um, these questions will get asked of Kenny. So, um, Kenny, do you want to fire on with your presentation? Yeah, if I can pop it up on the screen. Perfect. Zaz? Yeah. Perfect. Right. So, yeah, good evening. So, uh, you've had the introduction, so there's probably not really a point going, any, going through any more of it. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about recovery strategies and, and the kind of the science and the practicalities of recovery strategies. The talk is is aimed 
really at volleyball. However, these these rule these uh, strategies can be applied over a number of sports. But we will look at and refer an awful lot to, to volleyball and especially the men's program, which is the program I'm obviously involved in and mostly. Um, so straight off the bat, why do we do recovery at all? Well, we do recovery because sport is hard. We train to adapt and we, we train and we earn the right to improve and to play. So the training model in general then is that we train hard, we stress the body, but the body then adapts. And with that consistent stressing of the body and that consistent adaptation, what we hope to see is that performance capacity improves. So then we recover to allow that adaptation to take place. However, alongside that, now and again, we'll get unexpected or scheduled high workloads where we'll get insufficient recovery. That may come in the form of camps, it may come in the form of competitions, uh, it may come in the form of a congested uh, games calendar. And ultimately, with the insufficient recovery, we may see a reduction in performance and we possibly may see al also an increase in injuries. So what is recovery? Well, the science tells us that recovery refers to the restoration of the body's ph physiological and psychological processes, allowing athletes to potentially return to their pre-fatigue state and performance level. And in practice, today I will do what others won't so that tomorrow I can do what others can't. And that's been attributed to Jerry Rice, but who knows if it was Jerry Rice or not. So why do we do recovery? Well, if we're going to do it, it has to be reasoned and it has to be very much situation specific. And that's largely down to the fact that if we're left alone with enough time, most cases the body will recover. For years and years, athletes have been competing and training very well without never having, having a recovery program in place. But we do it, we'll very much what we do in recovery wise will depend very much about where we are in our season, what are our training goals at that current time, and potentially, say, for example, if we're a successful team, we may go further in competitions, we may do better in competitions, and that may mean that we have more games to play. So we have to make reasoned decisions off the back of the, those, those aspects. We also may have games in consecutive days, sometimes even the same day, and so that may then leave us with very little time or not enough time for adequate recovery. And when it comes to competition, we we don't have any power to adapt the schedule to allow more time for the current recovery that we possibly need. To deal with that, sometimes it might rotate players, but that obviously has a challenge of it might impact performance and it could all impact on team cohesiveness. So what are our options then is that we then have to try and make our best and optimise our performance with effective and reasoned recovery strategies. And the healthier prepared athletes may then give us an added benefit of reducing injuries alongside. What are we actually recovering from? So what does sport do to the body? So what we see is we see initially muscle glycogen depletion. So in essence, our energy stores start to become reduced. We sometimes see then muscle damage alongside, and that muscle damage is characterized by some muscle soreness, increased stiffness, some swelling and disruption of muscle fibers. We all know that feeling of the next day not being able to get out of bed or that feeling of walking down the stairs the next day. Um, we may also recover from dehydration due to the efforts we put in. And alongside that, there may also be mental fatigue, so central fatigue or, or peripheral fatigue as well, as well as the fact that we just become physically tired, mentally tired. So let's talk some volleyball. Um, the diverse and demanding competitive volleyball season will very often lead to significant muscle damage and fatigue. And we often don't have enough time between the sessions or matches to really get that full recovery. So consequently, athletes will experience diminished technical and tactical performance and technical efficiency because of this inadequate recovery. In terms of energy-wise, volleyball is mostly reliant on the anaerobic and the aerobic energy systems, so really taxing our glycogen stores. Uh, the sport is obviously dominated by kind of change of direction and jumping. Uh, and amongst the kind of numerous jumps that we do in volleyball, um, they're mostly counter-movement jumps. Counter movement jumps basically involve that kind of rapid decel that rapid drop into almost like a squat position, so an eccentric phase, and then we have a concentric phase where we then explode up, and then are followed by another eccentric phase as we then slow the body down as we come back down to the ground. These large eccentric kind of aspects of the jumping motion then impair the muscles' function, and that can then lead to some muscle swelling, stiffness, inflammation, and a delayed onset of muscle soreness, so, or DOMS as we call it. 
Um, what we know is that in the post-match, sometimes jump performance can be reduced as much as 0 to 12% in some athletes. And actually, counter movement jump, and again, in some, can take between 48 and 72 hours to recover for a complete recovery, which, again, in a competition phase, where you may play over a whole weekend, or you may play three or four games on the back of each other, it's going to be a challenge. So that's all very good. But what about us? What is the Scottish experience of this? So during the season, we're probably most interested in sort of injury prevention. But then we're interested then in performance when we come to our, our competition phase. We have both club and national interest, and probably tonight we have some club coaches as well as national team coaches on, online as well. And so what they'll want will be very different and what they'll need will be very different as well. So how do we make decisions then as a, as a, as a staff, as an organisation, as a, as a sports team on what we're going to employ for recovery? Well, this is where we probably come to this idea of blending science and art. And that when we want to apply the science as best we possibly can, not everything that we're going to look at tonight has, in essence, the greatest amount of evidence behind it or has been researched and found to have mixed results. And so very often we're going to mix some science alongside what, in essence, we would deem to be art or, or previous experience, potentially. Doing that then allows us to make some joint decision making. And that comes through the coaches, coaches to players, players to coaches, and then players and coaches to support staff and physios. And ultimately, that joint decision making is made easier if we then have some education alongside, which is exactly why we're all here, or some of you are here tonight, is to, in essence, have a better understanding of what these strategies are so that we can then start to put together some nice decision making together. What then is good practice for Scottish volleyball? Scottish volleyball? Well, I would argue that what is good practice for us is to monitor what our athletes do, so our athletes' workloads, monitor their state of recovery, and also monitor their well-being. So we really are looking after each and every one of our volleyball players. So a wee flavour of what the Scottish experience is. <clears throat> so we obviously play within the, the Small Nations competition. Um, which involves games on consecutive days, so sometimes three, sometimes four, depending on how many teams are there. These matches will vary in length and intensity, depending on the quality of the opposition, depending how well we play, how well they play. Um, and we usually also have some very tight travel schedules. We fly, may fly in the day before the first, first game and then fly out the day after the competition as well. And games, like I say, more often than not, day after day. Um, like all teams that travel, we want to stay in a hotel, so we have then challenges in terms of different beds and different environments. We have environmental challenges themselves. So, for example, say we would compete, say, in Iceland, where we may then go uh, play during the period where there's no the sun does not go down, which we've done. Uh, and so we have environmental challenges then in terms of light coming in the window all, all night. Or we may go and play in Cyprus, where the, the temperatures then can be incredibly high. Um, and we also then are, are um, prisoners to the scheduled meal times that potentially our hosts are putting on or we, or we have within the hotel. Um, so what do we do in the men's programme? So we do wellness monitoring via the team app, which is what you can see on the right hand side of the screen. Um, within that wellness monitoring, we monitor the player's sleep quality, their fatigue, their stress and their muscle soreness. Um, these are rated on a one to seven scale, going from very, very good uh, to very good, good, average, and then so on and so forth. And they have low and high for uh, stress levels uh, and, uh, and fatigue as well. We ran a trial run of this at the Celtic Nations just to so the players can get familiar with the programme and how we were going to run it. And we've run it consecutively in the last two competitions that the men's programme have done, both in the Faroe Islands of the Small Nations and then the Novotel Cup in Luxembourg. Um, this monitoring is done first thing in the morning. Uh, so that we can then we can make some decisions based on what the answers that come back, whether or not some players are showing signs of more fatigue, some players are showing more signs of stress. So in essence, we can then decide to intervene if we feel we need to, an arm around the shoulder, a chat, or we have, again, we can then start to reason some of our recovery processes and why we may then apply them on an individual basis rather than a team basis. So some very boring statistics, but in essence, this is what we... We looked at this with our results that we got from the Pharaohs and Small Nations in October 2019. Um, if you look at the graphs, so the T is the day we travelled. Uh, G1, 2 and 3 are the games we played. Um, and then the days after that, the days we travelled home. We monitor it before and after. Largely we do that so we can get an idea of potentially what their base levels are like. We did monitor for further days ahead of that, uh, what we see there for two or three days prior to that. But my PowerPoint skills to fit it all in were going to be challenged. So... 
Um, what we can start to see is and what we look at is for trends to some extent. So we can start to look at what our trends look like. So in sleep quality, what do we start to see is if the players in essence sleep particularly well before we, before we go, when we're traveling, they start to worsen slightly by game one, two, and three, we can see the trend starts to go down. So we move into having very few bad sleepers to then having more and bad sleepers. And then on the way home, things start to pick up again. Fatigue level very much again the same. We start off quite low levels of fatigue. By the time we get into game three, we're kind of average levels of fatigue, and then we start to climb back up again. Stress levels pretty much stay level with a pretty low stress bunch, the men's team by the looks of it. That stays pretty consistent for us. Uh, and our muscle soreness as well, the same, very low, and then starts to kind of descend downwards towards average. And again, we start to see some players with a, a rating of high muscle soreness as well towards game three, and even carrying on into the day after the last game. And then again, continuing onwards, we start to see improvement. Same then goes for Luxembourg and Novotel. So again, very similar. Sleep quality again starts to descend through travel in game one, two, and three, and picks up as we start to head home. Fatigue also starts to drop down. Stress again remains very, very, uh, very, very level. We have to look at that question and see whether or not we're actually we understand what they, what they were looking for in that. And we change that question in time. Uh, and then muscle soreness is similar again. So we can see over the two competitions, we have seen consistent trends that quality of sleep starts to reduce, our fatigue level starts to increase, stress levels start to stay pretty the same, but muscle soreness worsens as well. And that may all seem very obvious, and that's a given. But without testing and without looking, we can never really know for certain. So what tools do we have then to address some of these changes? It would be a good, uh, no PowerPoint presentation these days is good without a, a nice word cloud. So when you go and look at all the evidence or the science of the papers, that, that look into recovery methods. These are some of the things that show up. Imagery, stretching, massage, music, team bonding, uh, hydration, meditation, so on and so forth. So we're going to look at some of these, but what are the common practices? So in a study of 32 professional football teams, these are in essence of what came back as the common practices. Hydration, nutrition, right up there, number two. Right the top. Sleep then after that. Cold water immersion, contrast bathing, and then we go into active recovery, massage, stretching, and compression after. But despite the widespread use of this, the evidence of the efficacy is actually quite limited when you look at the science. There's a growing body of evidence that indicates that potentially recovery is actually down to the individual's preferences and what the person's perceptions of the intervention is. So that actually the person's perceived, the athlete's uh, perceived recovery may actually be our best tool. Athlete perception of this may be very different because these are obviously the results from that study were coming back from uh, staff and team coaches. And very often you'll, you'll find that recovery strategies are dictated to by what the coach or what staff potentially think is useful, maybe what they did when they were a player. But actually what an athlete's perception is very different of what, what they think is useful. So in our study, we looked at 890 team athletes of all levels. Rated as most important by all players, regardless of the type of sport they played, their gender, was sleep, fluid replacement, and then socialising with friends. And socialising with friends was perceived as one of the most important. Social support of a better, beneficial influence on performance, decreased stress, and players and, and teammates may be able to motivate the player to greater excitement and involvement. The men rated ice baths and supplements amongst the most important modalities, but that wasn't true for the women. The women actually rated discussions with their teammates and coaches um, after training and matches is significantly more important than the men did. Um, Yang in 2010 stated that female athletes in general are more willing than men to seek help and reach out to, or to more individuals for social support, including their coaches. So uh, coaches and athletes then have different perceptions of what might be useful. And that's good to know because then if all we do is dictate to the athletes and we know that their, their perception of recovery or their belief in what they're doing is important, there's no point just being dictatorial with it. So let's look then at some of the options we have and, and, and what, what is going to be useful for us to use. So hydrotherapy, the one that came out number one. What is hydrotherapy? Well, it isn't this, which is obviously what a lot of people believe it to, to, to be, or athletes will tell you is what it feels like. It isn't this, which is what we also see athletes actually do. What it looks more often like is, is like the bottom picture. And eagle-eyed amongst you will spot that's Andy Murray in there. 
Um, and very often that's what our players will look like, is in a tiny bath somewhere in the middle of nowhere, trying our best to do as a good a job as we can with recovery methods. So what is hydrotherapy? <clears throat> so basically, athletes basically typically immerse all or part of their bodies in water. The, the classic ice bath or cold water immersion is definitely the most well known of all of these. Um, and cold water immersion brings about some certain physiological changes. Uh, it's done via some hydrostatic pressure, so the pressure of the water on the body, the redistribution of blood flow, where we see a, a blood flow move from the periphery to the, cent to, to, the, to the center, and this might increase our blood volume, which may then give us better oxygen delivery. And then we see also see reductions in core and tissue temperatures, and this may be particularly important in, in heat situations. So, for example, if we start to think about some beach volleyball as well, we may be looking to use some sort of cold water immersion. If we're playing a particularly hot place or a particularly hot day, we may want to get the body's temperature down as fast as we possibly can. The evidence is that cold water immersion reduces thermal strain, reduces swelling potentially, inflammation, limb blood flow and muscle spasm. And alongside that pain, and it does that by slowing down neural signaling and releasing beta endorphins for a sense of well-being. And again, that's a nice important point to remember when we start to think about the kind of psychological aspect of recovery as well. But that list, what we can see is full of great things that we are going to be very interested in using or trying to access when we're trying to get players to feel like they've recovered. So cold water immersion and performance. The most studies have reported that cold water immersion can assist in performance recovery. Some studies will say that they don't see much significant effect from it. And there's a few, a few studies that will show that there's a detrimental effect on recovery. Um, performance enhancements have been found in a number of sports and a number of events, including cycling, running, climbing, vertical jump, which we're obviously very interested in, and some leg strength tests. There's only in volleyball, when we look at what evidence or science is out there, looking at cold water immersion. Um, Purno in 2011 looked at volleyball players and exposed to cold water immersion. Uh, thermal neutral water and some contrast bathing in comparison to just sitting, so doing a kind of passive recovery and doing nothing. And they found the cold water immersion and contrast bathing were the most effective in that of volleyball players' recovery. The Freitas 2017 looked at Brazilian professionals taking part in five consecutive days of training, maybe a bit of a reach to compare us to Brazilian professionals, but cold water immersion reduced the thigh circumference throughout the week, indicating that there was potentially some reduced swelling. Now, alongside that, the cold water immersion attenuated the the decrease in counter movement jump performed on the second day of training. So we may then start to see a reduction in the swelling that we're looking for to take away that muscle soreness and that muscle discomfort. Um, and we may also start to see that the, the impact on our ability to then jump day two is improved. So what are we looking for? What is the practice of cold water, immer cold water immersion? So temperatures are around about 10 degrees and 15 degrees seem to be optimal for performance recovery. If we can't hit these temperatures in a practical setting, then what we may look to do is then alter the immersion duration or the depth. So how, how long we're in for or how deep we go or how much of the body we put, it, we, we put in the water. Right about 10 to 20 minutes seem to be optimal. The deeper the immersion we can get, then the better the impact of the hydrostatic pressure is. Uh, around about 15 to 30 minutes post-exercise after we finish exercise is ideal, but we can see that there are some impacts going all the way up to three hours afterwards. Um, if we're looking to perform again on the same day, so we may have two games uh, start bookending the day or again with beach volleyball, um, we don't really want to use cold water immersion less than 45 minutes before high intensity exercise. Um, largely we think because to generate good power or to feel like we can generate power, we don't want to feel that we are stiff or we're tight or we're a bit sore or have to come out of the water. We want good temperature within the muscles. Um, if we have no access to cold water, then what we may look to do is just stay in the water longer if we can, or just go deeper into the water we're able to get access to. So for example, a pool or even in the sea, and the sea is a prime example of a recovery method we used in Gold Coast with the beach volleyball players. We would send them into the sea um, post games. If you can only get limbs into the water, like we saw Andy Murray doing, and, and what we very often find we have to do, then we just try and decrease the temperature as much as we can to get the same effect. Contrast water. So contrast water therapy, uh, those protocols usually alternate three to seven times between one minute of cold water immersion and one to two minutes of hot water immersion. 
and that cube of orange about 10, 6 to 15 minutes worth in the water, with the hot water being about 36 degrees and the, and the cold water being about 20 degrees Celsius. Um, some studies have looked at using a hot shower instead of a hot pool, largely just to see whether or not, just to try and mimic what most athletes have access to. Um, and around about 20 post-exercise studies looking at cold contrast water therapy, and nine report around, around nine report beneficial effects from it. Um, I've learned to look at a, a quite interesting study just again to try and mimic what we might see in volleyball or what we might have access to when we go away in trips. Where a study looked at contrast showers and whether or not the ability to do showering rather than in essence using pools or using baths, where they alternated between again hot and cold showers every minute for 14 minutes. Uh, it's female netball players in Australia where they immersed their entire body, including their head under the shower. Participants were required to alternate between two showers so they didn't have to actually adjust the water temperature. And when they used it immediately after netball training, it provided a similar perception of enhanced recovery when they compared it with the kind of standard contrast water therapy. So contrast showers then again become a potential uh, intervention that we may look to use. What is thermal neutral? Well, thermal neutral in essence is the water that comes out the tap. So water temperatures of approximately 35 degrees uh, are considered, to, or up to 35 degrees are considered to be thermal neutral. And that's largely because they don't alter our core temperature. Um, so for example, swimming pools usually fall somewhere in that thermal neutral uh, window. Uh, more often than not, thermal neutral is done, uh, studies are done in pools or, or, or larger baths, and very often then they, they include swimming, walking, or stretching. The athletes are doing swimming, walking, or stretching when they're in the water. <clears throat> uh, so because it's at the tap, the, the, the water temperature is usually quite easy to obtain. Uh, say swimming pools are very often readily available, certainly in some of the venues we've been to or we've played in for the Scotland Volleyball with the men's programme. Uh, and again, just some of the tap water out the hotel uh, hotel bath uh, or shower may be used to achieve a desired temperature. Um, based on the available literature, there was a possibility that thermal neutral immersion combined with aerobic exercise may improve recovery explosive performance. But due to the contrasting findings and the contrasting protocols, and a general lack of available literature, it's uncertain just what, what the impact of thermal neutral is on performance recovery. So what then is our guide? What, what do we tend to aim for and what would we kind of push our volleyball players towards? So as I say, we need to reason why we're going to use it. We don't just use it carte blanche on everybody. We need to have an understanding of what, what benefits it's going to give us and who might it benefit. So the key really, very well, one of the main keys is familiarisation. We want to make sure that you've used it before. We're not interested in, in your first ever time doing it as on after our first game of, of our, a small nations competition. So very often we we would encourage our players or our athletes to familiarise familiarise themselves with it, try it, but use it after a game, use it after a, a league game, just to see do you feel you recover better having used it or having not used it. Um, we need to reason that we're using it in competition or we're we using it in training. One of the reasons we do training, as we said at the beginning, is to stress the body so we get adaptation. What we don't want to do is blunt that adaptation by then putting everybody in ice after every single training session they do. So we may not want to use it if we are trying to push our athletes to get stronger, faster and better because we want that adaptation. We want to stress the body to get change. Where in competition, we may decide that actually we need players to stay at tip-top shape, so we may decide to use it at that stage. Um, we have to decide whether or not we want to use cold water immersion or do we want to use contrast bathing. We also have to be realistic. Um, as a good old scientist, I, my, my, I ran a test today of the, the, the bath water in my house in Linlithgow uh, and the cold water tap would fill the bath up only gets to 16.5 degrees. So we have to be realistic of what can we do with what do we have available to us. Can we get access to ice to be able to use it uh, in a hotel or at a venue? Um, do we have to be able to do what we can with showers and so on and so forth? Um, when for volleyball might it be useful in terms of our programmes? Well, very often the men's national team will do training weekends. Um, we'll do two days in a row or can as a winter training camp, we may do two or three days or back weekends back to back. But the, the load and the volume can be quite high and the intensity being quite high as well. So we may reason at that point, well, we want to get as much out of these weekends as we can because we don't get together very often. So we may apply it at that stage. We may also decide that we don't want to apply it at that stage because we, again, we're looking to try and get adaptation the best we possibly can. Uh, and again, if we start to see fatigue build up, that gives us a good reason to use it. 
So with cold water immersion then, basically we've got 15 minutes, ideally at fifth, around about 15 degrees. We want to immerse as much of the body as we possibly can. Ideally, we'd like them to be standing, and very often you'll see pictures of people doing cold water immersion in, in uh, wheelie bins. Um, uh, but again, not always possible. And then again, we want to try and do it as soon as after exercise as possible. Contrast water therapy, on the other hand, we're probably looking at about two minutes in each for about a minimum of six minutes. We can start in either, whether it be hot or cold you start with or whatever one you finish in. Um, the science that the papers don't seem to uh, have a, a conclusion on that. The hot temperatures around about 36 degrees and the cold around about 20. And similar again to the cold water, we want to try and get as deep as we possibly can if we are using a bath. So what are our variables that we can manipulate or we may have to manipulate depending on where we are? Well, we can manipulate hopefully the depth of the water, the temperature of the water and how long we're in there. So if we do have warmer water, we may have to stay longer in the water to try and get any effect. We may also just have to then try and go deeper if we can. I mean, if it's only the limbs we can get in, then we may want to look at trying to get colder. So, sleep. Sleep, the original and the best <clears throat> of all the recovery methods. Sleep is essential for optimal health, performance and recovery. We all do it. And really, growth and repair only really happen when you rest or when you sleep. Tired athlete very often means a slow athlete, and so sleep loss can be associated with a reaction impairment. Fatigue can affect the immune system, therefore we get insufficient recovery, leaves the athlete prone to some potential illness. Uh, shorter sleep periods don't provide the body with enough time to regenerate and repair cells, which is caused by training games and daily activity. And a lack of sleep can impair the body's ability to metabolize and absorb food. So athletes seek sleep is very often susceptible to situational stressors such as training, competition, selection, non-selection and travel. Um, reports suggest that athletes very often sleep worse around the competition periods, particularly nights prior to an important competition, with reduced sleep shown to negatively influence performance. Um, in a recent study of Australian athletes, 64% of the athletes surveyed indicated sleep disturbance prior to important competitions. Uh, and this finding is also comparable to uh, German athletes, where 65.8% of them also found that they, were, they struggled to sleep prior to, to major competitions. It's important to then, considering what, what we know then, is that athletes are made aware and educated on strategies to potentially help with that. And we very often see it referred to as sleep hygiene. Um, and what we may be interested in is, is to try and give them as much education around that to assist them to sleep when it gets round about important competitions. But it's also important not to be too stressed by one poor night. We more, A lot of the studies that look at sleep uh, sleep's impact on performance is very often done under sleep deprivation where, where people are not sleeping for two or three days or, or, or they're having, deliberately having their sleep broken up as well. So we don't want to be too stressed by one, one poor night of sleep because that may then lead to a second poor night of sleep. Uh, and we also don't want to be overly concerned by, say, using, say, watches or apps and such like that tell us how long we've slept for. Do we have good sleep or bad sleep? Again, they very often can lead to, to more stress than, than anything else. So to say they're not useful tools to some extent, but we want to be a bit careful about how we apply them. Um, sleep strategies should specifically focus on combating nervousness and thoughts prior to competition. Um, and in terms of sleep length, studies looking at six volleyball teams determined that an average sleep of about eight hours was optimal for all athletes over the age of 22. Um, most people sleep fine. And so we also don't want to make sleep into too much of an issue. Um, but it may be around about this competition phase where we, again, we want to intervene and, and see what impact we can possibly have to improve our performance. So what can we do to try and improve sleep? Well, we want to think about the environment. So they want the bedroom to be potentially cool, dark and quiet. We very often will say to some people to bring their own pillow. Again, it may just give them a sense of home and also a sort of sense of comfort as well. It can also be quite useful for, for travel. Um, and we want this ideally to stick to consistent hours. So we want to, wherever we at home, fall asleep and wake up, if we can stick to that when we're away traveling or we're staying overnight somewhere, we can try and get into some sort of pattern. And, and getting into a pattern and a routine with sleep seems to be the key. Um, Technology-wise, we don't want any late-night TV, phones, or tablets. Most, most um, technology these days have blue light filters on them, which you can select, which then again doesn't then stop. It has an impact then on allowing you to get to sleep and reduce it and getting you to sleep faster and better quality sleep. 
We want to turn off our notifications potentially on our phones as well. And there are apps available, so deep sleep app or meditation apps, which may also help with us getting us into our, our deeper sleep as well. Um, food or drink, we want to try and ideally avoid caffeine for five to six hours, but it's quite individual that and how, what impact it has. We want to avoid high volumes of drinks before we go to bed. That's largely because we don't have to wake up in the middle of the night to go into the bathroom. Uh, and it's also been shown that some, some milk pro proteins, um, so uh, milk proteins contain tryptophan, which in essence may also help with bringing about sort of serotonin, which then can give us a better night's sleep as well. So kind of a, a drink of hot milk not long before bed um, may also help get some sleep. And again, we want to avoid kind of large meals or eating too late into the night as well, because that might disturb our sleep. Um, why might this be quite pertinent? Well, our schedule, so very often we may have late night games, which can then have an impact on what time we get to bed after we've eaten, done all our recovery, had team meetings. We also very often may have early AM sessions or early leaves, so we may get up very early to go and travel to games um, in the league, um, so that can have an impact. Uh, team meetings, so whatever time they're scheduled for, do we have an early morning team meeting, a late team meeting as well? Can we rearrange the schedule potentially so we're not having to do those so that, again, we can prioritise getting athletes to sleep after playing rather than sitting in team meetings for 20, 30 minutes that may then run on to an hour? Um, Socialising, again, we want to be quite careful we're, we, we're, when we're away with teams or we're away travelling that this new environment doesn't bring about kind of late night sitting up, you know, in hotel lobbies, chatting away much later than it should be as well. So we want to try and schedule or make sure that athletes know that they want to try and stick to the, nor the normal routine. Um, and we may also want to try and schedule some time for winding down as well. Uh, so, for example, we may look to put some sessions of maybe some yoga, uh, some muscle relaxation, some meditation potentially as well, with a lot of teams now looking to apply those sort of, those sort of uh, interventions to see whether or not they may improve that the, their athletes sleep. So napping, it would be a, a sports science presentation with a Jan Lemur infographic these days. So uh, athletes suffering from some degree of sleep loss may benefit from a brief nap especially if maybe we're not training till later in the afternoon or in the evening. Um, if we wake very early for training or for competition, uh, we may then want to allow athletes to nap later in the day to try and get a little bit of restorative uh, sleep. Uh, but ideally with naps, you should keep them close to less than an hour and not too close to bedtime. Again, if you don't nap, and very few people will nap in day-to-day -day normal life, uh, and full-time athletes may, uh, but, but recreational athletes will not, uh, then there's, we would we wouldn't very we very rarely then encourage people to stop and start taking naps when we're away. But it may be useful if people are reporting that they are struggling to sleep, and as we saw in the results from our Scottish team, that we do start to struggle. So some athletes may benefit then. Um, why do we nap? Well, it's a nice way to get some relaxation, some reduce some potential mental fatigue. Um, it can also restore some wakefulness, promote some learning, and boost memory. Uh, and it can enhance both our physical and our cognitive performance as well. So some nice physical, physical and psychological impact from napping. Nutrition. Nutrition, in essence, is essential. It is seen as a non-negotiable and it is an absolute priority. So if we can do nothing else immediately post-game, we're going to want to try and get athletes to eat, if nothing else. Um, Contributing factor to fatigue is insufficient glycogen replace, uh, replenishment after repeated performance. Uh, we volleyball players primarily use carbohydrate as a primary fuel source. Uh, exercise stimulates protein synthesis, but also protein breakdown. So an absence of intake of protein after the exercise results in a net negative balance. And what we want is a positive balance to try and repair any exercise-induced muscle damage. So best practice then is to replenish our muscle glycogen stores as quickly as we possibly can after playing. To optimize the synthesis of muscle glycogen stores, we want to take of carbohydrates with a high glycemic index, um, and that ideally would be taken in after, in the first 60 minutes after finishing. If we don't have an appetite, then we may want to consider a sports drink or a smoothie, which then by being a liquid form allows us to have a uh, faster synthesis. And that sports drink then would be one that has a high carbohydrate, high protein level in it. Um, again, studies very often, the, these, these studies are very often done in elite athletes. Um, and again, with the recreational athletes, we're probably going to be more interested that yes, they get their, their hydration back in, but we're trying to try and prioritize eating more than anything else. 
What does high glycemic index mean? What well, it just is, it just causes a rapid rise in blood glucose, which means it's absorbed much quicker. So things like sugary food, soft drinks, white rice, uh, white bread, rice and potatoes. And there's a link there um, that you could use for an idea. You can search the foods to see what their glycemic index actually is. Um, so a consumption of around about 20 grams of milk protein seems to be sufficient to stimulate muscle protein synthesis during the first two hours of post-exercise recovery. So every athlete's favorite side, in essence, one of the best things we can use is chocolate milk. So chocolate milk contains carbohydrate and proteins in similar amounts to those used in studies demonstrating improved recovery. Chocolate milk may reduce muscle soreness. It may increase our subsequent performance. It may increase the stimulus for protein synthesis, and it may reduce the sleep onset latency. It's also cheap and easy to use and accessible for all of our athletes as well, regardless of age. What then is our guide that we would use for nutrition? So ideally we want real food first. Um, what we want as athletes is to have a good rounded diet. Um, by having a good rounded diet, we know then you will have the energy available to, to train and perform well. And it also means that we're not then having to try and play catch up when we're away with, with games or travel um, and try to improve or change your diet at that stage to try and make performance uh, optimum. So really, we really would always, always push real food first before anything else. Uh, in practice, well, we want to try out different options. So if you are during the season, you may want to try different drinks that have different makeups of carbohydrates, protein. You may want to try different food to see just what impact does it feel like it has on your recovery and how you feel in your perception of your recovery, what energy you feel you have afterwards. What feels best for you? What do you have? What do you use? It potentially upsets your stomach so that we know what to not use and what not to have if we are traveling and we can't get access to certain types of food. Key with nutrition very often is to be organized. We can't always rely on the hosts or com uh, competition hosts. We can't always rely on hotels to, be able to provide food uh, that is going to be what we want in a nice rounded diet or with the volume or the type of food that we're actually interested in. So be organized and be ready to take food with you. Or what we very often do away is, is make sure that some of these sources we may be able to get to a supermarket nearby where we could then go and source some of our own food as well. Um, we can't always rely on what availability there might be at the sports hall we're at or potentially down at the beach. Uh, and also when we do when we do when we go on traveling, we want to make sure that we have we always have food available and we take food with us wherever we go. Um, part of nutrition very often what we see is, is supplement use as well. But again, do we really need to use these supplements in recreational athletes? Um, most, if we're using supplements because we are missing something within our diet or we show ourselves to be quite low on something, ideally and more often than not, that can be addressed just by changing diet diet behaviours and, and, and diet practices as well. And if need be, then you can always speak to a sports nutritionist. If you are going to use supplements, however, it's very important that they're batch tested for any anti-doping problems. Uh, and if we, in a previous talk, we looked at anti-doping with Scottish volleyball. And so any supplements you take, we want to make sure that they come from a, a reliable source and not bought off the internet. And if they are, then we know where they come from. Uh, and the website involved for that is a, a website called informedsport.com, which then in essence you can get some further details on there. So what are our food choices we may look for for during competition to, to help with performance as well as for recovery afterwards? So for matches lasting less than an hour, we may just want some water to sip on or to use. Uh, or potentially some electrolyte drinks. For games that may go longer, we may want a sports drink which has carbohydrate in it, uh, plus also sip, sipping on water at the same time. We may want to have milk access as well for, as a, for during competition. We may want to use fresh fruit and trail mix, sports bars and energy bars and muesli bars, some yogurt and custard, which again will give us some of our protein. We may want sandwiches or rolls with honey, jam and banana. Crackers, rice crackers, so just all examples that we could potentially use, all, that, all food that has nice high glycemic index as well. What do we want for recovery then? What will our food choices be different? Well, again, for recovery, we want a sports drink as a potential source of our carbohydrates. Um, smoothies, homemade smoothies with, with fruit and so on and so forth in it, with honey, um, with potentially with protein added to it as well, can have a big impact. And then we want our chocolate milk. Same again, nuts, fresh fruit. 
sports bars or recovery bars, but we want to make sure they're not just protein bars, that they also have some carbohydrate in them also. And then again, we look at for, for, for protein potentially through yogurt and such like sandwiches, but this time maybe with some meat, fish, cheese within them. For our evening meals, Again, the, the choices are huge, and that website of the Glycemic Index, uh, you can have a look at as well, but we may look at things like pasta, rice, vegetables, fish, meat, chicken, but ideally what we want is lots of color. I'm always a big fan of plates that have lots of different colors, lots of different type, food types on them as well. That tends to be a nice indication of, of, of varying, um, of, of good variety as well. We obviously have athletes now who have various um, food allergies or following specific diets. I'm not going to touch on them here, but again, the impact of those on performance and the research into those at the moment is still quite mixed, and we don't have clear pictures on what impact they might have. Kenny, I, um, I don't know yeah. if you can see the question from Ali Jack on the screen. Oh, I can't. Um, no. So he's asking, is there any evidence on tart cherry juice or similar after chocolate mm. milk? So there is. So in essence, tart cherry juice is used an awful lot for to try and combat and, uh, oxidative stress after exercise. So again, studies done using uh, tart cherry juice, are, are most of them in elite athletes. So that's not to say that we wouldn't use it but it's not something necessarily that we, we would use primarily, and it's also not something we can always get our hands on particularly easily. Um, so we would usually always go there just with the water, the sports drink, and then potentially the chocolate milk as well. But we have looked at that before, and we have discussed using it in the men's team, which is where the question probably comes from. Yeah. All right. um, another question we've got, um, if your athletes have minimal resources at their disposal, what would you say is at the top of your must list to ensure that the athletes get the recovery they need? Um, so I would I would always go with food. I think nutrition has to be the absolute goal. Uh, and whether or not that's even making your own food to take, if you're, if you're not looking to buy it, but I would say nutrition is going to be our number one, our number one go-to. Um, and then alongside that, it's behavioral things. So like sleep um, is getting an easy win. You know, the, 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 these are the two that I would say are definite goes tos and they're also kind of easy ones to be able to apply as well. Okay. Um, there's another one popped up on the screen as well, which is an interesting one. If our beach tour players play up to six matches in a day, what can they do to help the recovery after matches when they potentially have another match or referee straight away? So we'll come to beach later on. There's a Good. slide on beach. <laughs> okay, perfect. I saw that one coming. Um, Thanks, is that out just now? Yeah, that's perfect. Perfect. So, so hydration. So complete restoration of fluid balance after a match is an important part of the recovery process. It assists our glycogen and protein synthesis. Uh, it can speed up our glycogen and protein synthesis and also helps with removal of any metabolites. Um, our risks with the hydration, obviously, is whether or not we become dehydrated. So a 2% loss in weight would mean we become dehydrated and more than 10% body weight losses it would be severe dehydration. One way, can one way to measure how much fluid you have to replace after play is to weigh yourself pre and post match or post training. For each one kilogram of body weight you lose by the end of play or practice, you have to drink about 1 to 1.2 litres of fluid. Um, so as I said, with hydration, water, Carbohydrate, sports drink with protein and electrolytes in it are usually the most effective for after play. Um, we'd also recommend you choose a sports drink that tastes good, so you actually do want to drink it. And ideally, choose a non-carbonated sports drink, because carbonation can very often make us feel quite full, and we don't really want to drink as much. Um, what we're interested, obviously, is, is how fast do we consume water or fluid after a competition or after a game is finished. Um, so ideally we recommend to drink quite a large volume of fluid after the match instead of small quantities gradually. We want to try and help that, that, that protein synthesis or try and get rehydrated as fast as we possibly can. Um, research shows that the natural thirst mechanism makes individuals consume only approximately half the amount of fluid they've lost. So it's thought that the thirst mechanism does not initiate the drive to drink until the body is 2% dehydrated, which is the point where performance may be compromised. So just drinking, because not drinking because you don't feel thirsty, Again, post-exercise is not really what we're going to be looking for. Um, one of the tools we use when we're away traveling very often is we use a, a urine chart, which you can see again on the screen. Uh, and most of the athletes' bedrooms or bedrooms staying in the hotels will have this on the wall. And that allows our athletes then to monitor 
just what their 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 level of hydration currently is as well, whether or not they need to be drinking more uh, than what they what they currently are as well. So it's again a really useful tool that can be made available to all our, all our squads and teams as well. Massage. So proposed benefits of sports massage include improved recovery, performance, and injury prevention. What does the science tell us, however, is that massage doesn't really have any effect on strength. It doesn't really have any effect on jump performance or sprint performance, and that's including a study where it looked at female volleyball players. It doesn't really have much effect on fatigue markers. It does improve our flexibility, and it can have quite a large effect on, on DOM, so our, our muscle soreness. That's more often measured with subjective scores. So how do back athletes feel? Do they feel that the muscles are less sore rather than necessarily physiologically that the... the, the the cells are the, the moving the system that actually caused them, so not that's actually changed. Um, so it may be more impactful in repeated efforts, such as multi-day competitions, such as small nations, or competitions that go over two or three days. It may then be more useful at that stage. So in practice, what do we see? Well, we, potentially massage might give us a sense of perceived recovery. Athletes like it. They feel like they are better and they are recovered after having it, whether it's straight away afterwards or whether it's the next day very often quite relaxing at the same time. And again, it's been shown that it may also promote some sleep and help athletes sleep at the same time. Um, there are significant psychological benefits to massage uh, with a decreased expression of stress biomarkers, so cortisol in the system. This might be found in shorter massages of five to 10 minutes, maybe more beneficial in acute recovery than long massages. And again, very often we'd encourage athletes to experiment first. Uh, again, the first time you get a massage shouldn't be the day after a massive competition or a huge competition because we don't know or you don't know what the impact might be on how you recover. So just because there's massage available and you have a physio there, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden you should use it. Again, we need to reason why we're putting any recovery process in and it has to be a, a, a smart decision based on, like, say, the science of what practice we use. Compression. So compression has been proposed to prevent performance deterioration and improve recovery by accelerating nutrient delivery and metabolite and metabolite and accelerating recovery of muscular power, strength, and endurance. So sounds great. So the science, so in the clinical setting, compression garments have been shown to compress dilated veins and reduce venous reflux, to enhance venous return and reduce edema or reduce swelling. This increased muscle pump may accelerate blood flow. And we may see enhanced recovery of strength and power performance. It seems to be most effective for improving long-term recovery, so 24-hour recovery, and exercise that enlarges, elicits a large degree of muscle damage. Um, it seems to reduce perceived soreness also. Uh, and really what we're interested in very often is that the fit of the garment and just how tight it is. So in practice, the nice thing about compression is, again, it's accessible to everyone, but individuals will have their own preference whether or not they like it or they don't like it. And again, we really encourage people to try it, to see what they like and see how it feels. So again, it can then be applied appropriately. Um, we advise ideally to wear it immediately following bath bathing uh, or ice bathing or cold bathing or contrast bathing on any competition days we have. As I said, we want it to be tight as you can tolerate as the compression forces the goal, so how much we can compress the system. Uh, so always check the fit of the garment. Um, we can also wear them for travel, which might then have an impact on how the legs feel after a long day of travel. Um, and we can also be worn for sleep again. But the problem with sleep very often is that if you've not used them before and all of a sudden you start to use them, they can disturb sleep because some athletes will feel very, very warm in them. Um, and so ultimately, anecdotally, the evidence is that they suggest really good enhancement of recovery. And there's very few complaints regarding comfort in them as well. Cool downs. Coaches love a cool down. The problem with science, the science, well, the science says that active cool down has never really been thoroughly reviewed. And there's really no evidence of any validated cool down protocols within volleyball, particularly. Active cool down is largely ineffective at improving sports performance later on the same day, especially when time between successive training sessions or competitions is more than four hours. It's most likely ineffective at improving sports performance during the next day, but some perceived beneficial effects have been observed. It may reduce blood lactate levels, but faster lactate removal doesn't always necessarily mean we're going to see subsequent improvement in athletic performance. 
and also but blood lactate actually returns to resting level very often within 20 to 20, 120 minutes with no exercise or no active after exercise with no active recovery it doesn't seem to have much effect on doms um, stretching which very often appears in cool downs doesn't seem to improve our post exercise recovery either and studies indicate that players perceive an active cool down however to be more beneficial than a passive one so players also like a cool down or believe again perceive it to be that it is useful for them so in practice what the cool downs look like well very often these days cool downs look like foam rolling or a quick run around the court at the end or taking your shoes off and running around the court um, but there's no evidence that that foam rolling itself improves recovery no two people ever put the same pressure on a foam roller and no one ever spends the same amount of time on each area however again Athletes will very often report that they like it and they feel better for doing it. Um, active cool downs can very often include relaxation, socialising, and actually give athletes time to reflect upon the training or the match. Um, they may prevent development of additional fatigue alongside. They very often involve low to moderate mechanical impact. Uh, I want to make sure if we're going to do it. Sorry, if we're, to, if we're going to do it, we want to prevent development of additional fatigue so if we're going to do something to cool down we don't want it to be that hard that then we actually fatigue people more we want to make sure if we choose to do something that is low to moderate mechanical impact so we're not causing more muscular damage or increasing our, our doms we want it to be quite short so we don't get in the way of interference or interfere with glycogen resynthesis and we don't spend such a long time doing it that we get in the way of eating or getting to the ice bath or getting a meal or getting back to the hotel um, and getting to sleep. Um, and ideally it would involve exercise that is preferred by the individual athlete. So what do we want cool downs to probably look like then? Well, we probably is really ultimately the chance to actually get a time to chat through the game to actually start to have an impact on mentally how do the players feel, but also give them a chance to actually do their own thing uh, and what do they feel they benefit most from, rather than, again, being too dictatorial in terms of what we actually do. So psychological. Kenny? What's it yep. um, We've got a couple of questions on cooldown. Um, so one of our colleagues has asked... Should we remove shoes during the cooldown phase around the hall? Is there any benefits to it? <laughs> uh, again, it's going to be very individual whether or not the person feels the benefit from it or likes it. There's no papers on it. Okay, perfect. The other one was, here we go. What do you think about self-myothacial release slash um, foam rolling? Foam rollers and balls, so I kind of answer that question. So my instinct is that I don't use them for, in essence, any clinical benefit, uh, but very often players will, will feel that they benefit from it or they, they like it. I don't encourage players to spend the whole time doing active recovery doing it, um, but if they want to use it, then I don't really have a huge complaint about it more often than not. Um, as I say, everybody uses them differently. Everybody feels different effects from it to some extent. Very often, what we found is that people use it because their friend uses it. Uh, they have no idea what they should feel. They have no idea what difference it makes. Um, if it does have an impact, it may impact on flexibility. So if people feel that they can move further or they're a bit looser after using it. But again, the argument would be is that do we really want athletes to feel loose and kind of wobbly afterwards? Um, does it have a negative impact then on potential performance the next day? Because we don't really need all that extra movement. You know, we don't play a sport where lots of extra range is required. We play a sport which is a power-based sport, you know, which, you know, does it have a negative impact on power output? And again, there'll be some studies out there that say it does. So... So if you want to use it, use it. Don't spend 45 minutes doing it. Don't cause yourself all sorts of pain doing it. But if you feel you benefit from it, then yeah, feel free. Okay. Uh, just one last one before we move on. Are the recovery methods different for each of the disciplines or do you think they should be the same? As in beach to... Beach and indoor. Um, so again, we'll come to beach a little bit in a, in a second. Um. Yeah, we'll come to beach, so we'll probably cover a wee bit of that at the end, if that's all right. Okay, thanks. Um, so psychological mental fatigue. Um, so mental fatigue is an area of great interest, but but one where we actually know very little to some extent. Um, impaired psychological well-being, so stress, anxiety, um, can affect athletes' readiness to train, leading to diminished performance. 
perception of effort may change decision making and impact on decision making and skill execution. Low mood may also result in dependent and impact on sleep. And only a minority of athletes actually employ mental or emotional recovery techniques. 77% for recovery from injury and 25% for, co for competition preparation. Despite the fact that most of them actually believe in the effectiveness of the techniques themselves. So what evidence do we have within volleyball itself? Well, there are a few papers that have looked at this within 40 female volleyball players. They looked at psychological assessment scales to see whether or not any scores were going to be predictive of performance. And actually what they found was that a variety of negative associations with high anxiety, stress and sleep disruption may then we go on to harm acute neuromuscular performance. Uh, one study which looked at male and female indoor team sports, which included quite a large percentage of volleyball players, looked at whether or not changes in perceived stress and recovery over the course of a season were risk factors for injury. They found that a decreased amount of perceived recovery time was associated with an increased risk of injury. This would suggest that it may be useful for coaches and training staff to establish team recovery sessions and monitor players to determine whether they are receiving enough rest. The same study indicated that other practices such as time, time with friends, team building activities and amusement are helpful in promoting recovery and preventing injury. Um, Kloss looked at recovery, a review of recovery in volleyball and noted that positive psychological practices such again as amusement or time with friends are very beneficial to the recovery phase. And the mental state of volleyball players during recovery should be monitored as decreased perceived recovery is associated with increased injury rates. So again, to come back to what we talked about at the very beginning, what is good practice for Scottish volleyball? Well, good practice probably starts to include the fact that we're going to look at and monitor how do our players feel? What is their current mental state? How do they feel they're recovered? Are they feeling that they're recovered? And are we doing everything we can to help them feel that they are recovering? What do we do to potentially give them that peer support and that support group? And do they all athletes have the same support group or support group available to them so we can see improvements in their performance? So in practice, what does, how, how can we potentially have an impact on psychological and mental fatigue? Well, we looked at a little bit with sleep and with napping and the, the potential improvement of stress levels that napping can give us. Um, Meditation is found to be very, very, very useful when it comes to psychological and mental fatigue. Um, mindfulness is something we find very interesting at the moment. Mindfulness practice may decrease psychological stress parameters, and this low tension could lead athletes to more goal-orientated performance. So mindfulness, there's been some, studies, some really nice studies looking at this, which potentially as we see lowered levels of lactate concentration after mindfulness practice. We see decreased salivary cortisol levels, so stress, stress hormones. We see a lower immune responsiveness upon mindfulness practice, which might attenuate some exercise-induced inflammation. So we might actually see some recovery time be reduced by using mindfulness. So while more experienced athletes may have built strategies or resilience, less experienced players may find the prolonged challenge of three or four day competitions quite mentally challenging. So again, we need to reason why we're going to do what we do and how do we monitor these athletes individually to make sure what we're going to do is going to be impactful. Again, we are not full-time athletes, so a lot of our athletes will be under varying levels of stress. They may have exam exams ongoing, family issues, some life stress. Um, so it's probably important, again, that we're, we know our athletes, um, we're able to talk to our athletes, uh, and that we put in place some sort of potential intervention in the form of potential social time, make sure we schedule social time in, and we have some sort of team activities as well, or activities that may help them unwind, basically. So ultimately, what might all this look like, and what is our decision-making going to look like for, for coaches, for athletes? So after the end of a game, we're going to look at for hydration, and we're going to try and get on board our sports drink. We're going to try and take on board our chocolate milk and have a snack that's going to be high glycemic index. We may then want to think about getting in the cold water or the immersion or into the contrast bath. That may then be followed by having our evening meal or our lunch, whatever food is then available. We may then want to think about putting our compression on. And at that point, we may also then want to think about what psychological interventions maybe we want to then put in, whether that be a team meeting, whether it be a debrief, whether it be whatever, again, for the individual or for the team, may be very, very useful. So that then, in essence, is the tool that we want to use. We will not then be able to use all of them because they may not all be available. But if we want to start thinking about what is best practice, 
this is probably the protocol we want to start to think about following the best we possibly can. So youth athletes. So we're developing athletes of the future. So the key then here will be is, is, is their education and understanding. So again, that's why some of our coaches are hopefully an athlete, the youth athletes are potentially on here tonight. Um, that is going to be the key is, is how do we educate our young athletes in good practices? How do we educate coaches in good practices? But also understand why they're doing what they're doing. If a coach, very often with children or youth athletes, uh, if a coach tells them they're recovered, they may believe it. And if they tell them something doesn't work, they may also believe that as well. So the biggest influence will be coaches or, as we said, talking about form rollers, their peers as well. So is it belief and perception is maybe that is what we're going to try and influence as best we possibly can. It's important that we also get youth athletes to be part of the process and we have nice clear communication between coaches and support staff and the athletes about why we're doing what we're doing in terms of recovery as well. We want them to be able to feed in and we also want to be able to feed back to them as well. Um, and that will then probably start to put together the best program that is going to be for that individual and what they feel their perception of recovery and what improves their perception of their recovery. So with youth athletes, basically we want to get the basics right. We want to get sleep and nutrition right more than anything else. We want to be absolutely sure they know what good food, real food is and that they're eating it as best they can. We also want to make sure that they have good sleep practices and that they are getting the appropriate amount of sleep which expands not just in their sports performance, but in essence, it expands it into their life in general as well. In terms of cooling, well, there's a real paucity of data on the rationale and effectiveness for younger ones, be they elite athletes, young elite youth athletes or amateur athletes. Pre-pubertal youth recover quicker than adults, mainly due to their lower relative power capabilities, but also due to their relative larger flexibility and muscle compliance, which makes them a bit less susceptible to muscle damage uh, than their adult counterparts. Muscle damage and its symptoms are, symptoms are a lot less in pre-adolescence and adolescence, especially when doing similar eccentric exercise protocols and loading patterns were applied. It also in a recent meta-analysis, it appear that the effects of cold water immersion on young athletes are small to non-existent, either acutely or over a few days after the exercise bout. With sleep, there's accumulating evidence that insufficient sleep increases risk of injury. Adolescents sleeping less than eight hours a night are found to be 1.7 times more likely to experience a significant injury than those that slept more than eight hours. Van Rosen looked at a performance survey based of 496 adolescents in Sweden. Um, and he collected information of self-reported injuries, sleep duration, stress, training exposure, nutrition and competence-based self-esteem. So a lot of the things we've talked about already. And they found that self-reported sleep duration of eight hours per night was associated with a 46% increase in the risk of injury. So what then does that look like in practice for us? Well, we will, again, we want to make sure that children who are 13 to 18 years of age ideally are sleeping around about eight to 10 hours a night. And again, educating them on this fact is going to be a big key. When planning the use of any recovery modalities then in our youth athletes, it's important that practitioners, ourselves, coaches and parents understand that physical training is characterized by stressors which stimulate the bodies to adapt. So in essence, we want children to get stronger. The purpose of training is to make them better rounded athletes. And so by trying to dampen the effect of training, do we then impact on their ability to improve? So in the case of skeletal muscle, that will produce stronger, better functioning muscles if we actually stress them via training. So when intervene to accelerate any such processes, or amplify the potential for adaptation, we need to make sure that the intervention we use is safe, it's effective, and does, no, does not harm the long-term potential for adaptation in a young athlete. So what might it look like in our youth athletes? Well, it may still look like hydration afterwards. We're definitely going to let the youth athletes have their chocolate milk and their, their, their snack to get their energy levels back up. We're going to make sure they eat a nice rounded diet and a good, a good meal. And we may still want to then put in place psychological interventions. We want to start to get athletes being willing to open up and talk about the stress levels, the fatigue levels they may feel, um, so that, again, that we get a better understanding that when we then move into, say, the senior teams, it's far easier for them to reach out and it's far easier for us to have an impact on how they perform as well. Female athletes. So, 
a quick note on female athletes particularly is that we're not all the same. In terms of hydrotherapy, well, it shows that female athletes may actually show a greater degree of muscle damage after 20 to 24 hours compared with male athletes. Females demonstrate an earlier post-exercise inflammatory response. Recovery strategies making use of cold exposure to reduce post-exercise inflammatory response may be particularly beneficial to athletic women. Carter showed a greater decrease in arterial blood flow pressure after exercise in females than males. Um, and it may decrease below its pre-exercise value during passive recovery. So very often we find some lightheadedness. So they may also then hugely benefit from compression as well to try and maintain that blood pressure and get the blood pressure back up and get blood flow back from the periphery into this at the central system. Um, a comparison of males and females within the same body fat percentage found that females cool to a greater extent, confirming the assumption that lower surface area to mass or ratio of males is favourable for heat retention. And again, females may also sometimes be a bit more thermosensitive as well. Uh, and very often thermosensitivity will change alongside the menstrual cycle. So beach. So what is our challenge in terms of the beach? Well, we are in Scotland, but it very often is heat. Um, heat is going to be the, one of the biggest impactors on just how athletes feel when playing beach. So our advice very often is one of the first recovery tools is get out of the sun, get out of the heat in some in some some way if we possibly can. Our challenge very often is that, as mentioned, is that very often players will stop playing and then go immediately on to then referee or they'll immediately go and sit in stands to go and watch games as well. Um, we also see that games are very often interspersed over short periods of time in, in pools uh, and that dehydration is very often dependent on the heat. And so, again, we want to make sure that we're consistently drinking enough water and potentially our sports drink. However, if we're going to be playing through a whole day, we have to be aware that sometimes carbohydrate drinks or protein drinks can be a bit impactful on gastrointestinal problems and cause some stomach discomfort as well. So we probably want to be thinking more of sipping on these drinks uh, than we do want to be taking off bottle after bottle after bottle. Um, some of the challenges within beach volleyball is that we think is the compliance and the instability of the sand may actually increase the impact on muscular demand. And one of the few studies that's actually looked at it found that actually reduced sprint performance and reduced muscle contraction strength uh, and lower than muscles post game. It took around about three hours for that recovery, for that, that uh, sprint performance and uh, muscle strength to return to normal. But that study was only done on friendly games. So we probably can assume that in actual competitive matches, those numbers are probably even higher. So what do we, what do we encourage? Well, again, if we can get access to cold water immersion, we may then encourage athletes to go and try and get some sense of, of, of cool or cold. But we may also then, the, the beach have only option but to use, say, for example, cotton trash showers, or we may send them off into the sea, or we can then send them in quite deep into the sea so we can get that, that the hydrostatic pressure. Uh, and again, we may get them to do some very light exercise and walking in the sea, some stretches in the sea as well, just to again try and get, continue to get the body moving. However, as you mentioned, with cold water immersion, we don't really want to use it too close to our next game because, again, we might feel the muscle temperature drop so much and actually we want that nice warm muscle for performance. It's also important that we eat regularly but smartly. We're not going to look to try and take on huge amounts of food because it may have an issue then in terms of gastric emptying, but we do want to take on small amounts of carbohydrates and protein throughout the day as best we possibly can. Um, but when we do get a window or an opportunity to take on more, we want to take that opportunity we possibly can. Again, compression may be very useful in beach volleyball athletes, again, because we want to try and reduce that swelling or that muscle edema we might get immediately after finishing a game. And so we may want to get some compression leggings on if we possibly can. And we may even want to use those compression leggings potentially in the water at the same time. But again, if it's going to be warm, we need to be aware of that heat and then all of a sudden putting those compression tights on also. And that is us. Thank you. Fantastic. And um, so, Kenny, we've got some more questions here. Um, so Sam Shenton's asked, um, do you have any advice on increased calories during a training camp tournament or is it more beneficial to stick to the athlete's normal routine? So I more often than not would say it's, it's beneficial to stick to your normal routine. Um, 
one of the things we would say is that yes, you can try and increase some some calorie count if if you want to. But again, we would very often encourage people to experiment with that. Um, so we don't want all of a sudden to watch training camp to say I'm going to double the amount of a meeting and all of a sudden feel quite uncomfortable or feel that we can't really we don't feel comfortable to jump or move. So we very often try and stick to a normal routine as best we can uh, and not change things massively. Okay. Um, we have another f- uh, question from Andrew Fleming. When working with the national team, are you made aware of the national team's long-term planning, the team's potential training load and schedule? And how does this help you to prepare for the needs of the players? Um, so in terms then of long-term, in terms of long-term planning, in essence, having been involved now for nine years, we have a pretty decent idea of what most of our, our competition schedule will look like. So it does allow us then to start to think about getting players to put in place some recovery strategies in the season ahead so we can start to see what do they feel like. Um, what was the rest of the question? Trust him to ask a, hard, a long question. It was a very long question. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah, again, we do have – very often we'll do, like, say, winter training camps. So those winter training camps, um, we may often think about – making sure that they are, the athletes are ready to go and use some of these interventions because they are going to potentially be some of the hardest weekends we will do alongside. Uh, in terms of clubs, well, again, our, the club season will vary depending on how much congestion there are of matches. So it, it can vary massively very often as well. Um, but yeah, we can prepare as best we can, especially for the men's team. And again, hopefully going forward for, for the other squads as well. Perfect. Um, so we have a question about the wellness stats. Um, do you use wellness stats only during competition or do you ask the players to complete them during the season? So at the moment, because it's a national team that we mostly work with, we only do them during competition phase. We don't do them during the season. Um, we may look to change that with one or two one or two teams and start to see if we can start to look and monitor wellness through the season. Um, we've considered monitoring individual players who are within the national men's team program and see in essence monitor their wellness and so on and so forth but again with recreational athletes you have to wonder how much can be impact on their general wellness more than anything else and are we going to be better spend monitoring say injury rates um are we better uh, monitoring the, the the workload they are doing and how they're coping with the workload necessarily then and say actual wellness or, men, or mental mental health scores and such yeah Okay, um, so question or a, a hint from one of our national team coaches. Um, <laughs> do you want to just mention a little bit about your shoulder prehabilitation program? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we, uh, yeah. So, so in essence, we obviously have some kind of hot spots in volleyball. So we have knees and shoulders, who obviously are two of our highest injury rate or highest injury incidence areas that we see. Um, so again, to try and be as impactful as we possibly can, uh, we want to look to see, can we bring those injury rates down in some form? Uh, and we're, gonna, we're, we're looking to do that via integrating, I suppose, like injury prevention programs or injury reduction programs rather than prevention, because you cannot always prevent injuries. But, Programs that, in essence, are aimed in about potentially reducing injuries or potentially improving performance in these areas, because these, I say, are hotspot areas. How do we improve shoulder performance? How do we improve knee performance to some extent? How do we make players more available uh, than what they may be, because injury may may, may rob us of of having them available to us? So we're looking to integrate a warm-up routine or exercises into a warm-up routine that may, again, have the science behind our science-backed exercises, which might prevent or, or reduce the occurrence, potentially, of some of these shoulders. Um, and we've integrated that into the men's team, who now use it in all their warm-up programmes. Uh, we've also integrated it into uh, one or two of the club teams, including uh, Edinburgh University women's team as well. And, and at the moment, anecdotally, it's going to be bringing down shoulder complaints from players and players find that they are available more or that the level of discomfort they get from the shoulder seems to be reducing as well. Um, we're doing it largely because it varies very, it varies hugely what each of our individual athletes do. 
Um, they all play for different clubs. So they all have different warm-up routines, they all have different strength and conditioning. Some do some strength and conditioning, some do none. So we want to try and find a consistency within the program by having them do, at least we know they'll be consistent with something. And if that something is exercises that maybe are bodyweight exercises or banded-based exercises uh, that they can do with very little equipment or in their own home, we might then see a nice positive impact on that as well. And we'll hopefully do the same with the FFT moving forward too. Um, but we can stay tuned on that front because we hope to roll something along those lines out on a wider scale for, for all of Scottish volleyball. Yeah. Uh, we have another question from Rachel Morrison. If training games finish late at night, how do you prioritise sleep versus hydration? Uh, I would probably, well, ideally then we want to try and get hydration in straight away after the game. So really the key would be is can we get hydration in straight away because it's unlikely you're going to be going to bed straight away after finishing a game. So I'd probably aim mostly to get hydration in as soon as we can post-game. Um, and then we still want to prioritise sleep as best we can later on in the night as well. Um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd still prioritise sleep over most things, but I would certainly be looking to try and get volume of, of fluid back in as quick as we can. And then ideally we can then reduce how much we're taking as the rest of the evening goes on. Perfect. Uh, we have a question about the club programme that you said you were running. Um, how can other clubs get involved with this? In terms of the shoulders or? Yeah, the shoulder. The stuff that you're doing with, you said the men's national team and you said that you're doing University of Edinburgh. Oh, yeah. Um, so we, so in the moment, well, the, the, the plan is in this, for the next, hopefully the next six months, what we'll do is we'll be able to actually get a, a programme put together and get it on hopefully on the website, the, the, the SVA's website, where we may then be able to make it accessible for, for, for all to some extent. Um, there are some great programmes out there, say there's things like Australian Rules Football, uh, there's some great things like things like football and with the FIFA 11 Plus, where they are kind of catch-all injury reduction programmes or kind of warm-up programmes aimed at trying to reduce injuries. Um, and so our goal, our hope is, is that we'll be able to put something along the lines of that together that we'll then be able to roll out and make accessible to all. So, and that will come in the form of videos or instructions and so on and so forth. So um, hopefully everybody will be able to be involved. It's just yeah. it's putting that together and the time to put that together. Definitely. Um, another thing is a bit of a personal question for you. Um, how do you prepare for injuries on tours? So things like um, trauma. So I think there's a, an ex <laughs> specific example of one of the players who rolled their ankle, which looked horrific mm. on TV. Yes, it was horrific. It was horrific being there as well. Um, <laughs> so we, in essence, we, we, we do checklists. So we prepare, we prepare by basically knowing as much as we possibly can about the environment. So for example, we will, before we start a competition, we'll know um, what, what medical facilities are available in the hall. Um, we will prepare by finding out where's the nearest hospital, uh, which hospital has been used by the tournament itself, um, where's the first aid room, uh, what medical equipment is on site, and what other medical equipment do we think we may need that we could potentially get on site if we can. Um, and basically be as prepared as we possibly can. Uh, yeah. And that's the key. Uh, there's no there's no sort of magic trick to it. It's when dealing with trauma or dealing with injuries when we're abroad, it's, 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 being, it's being knowledgeable about what, what's available to us to some extent, so be as ready as we possibly can. So I think the next one is a job interview for yourself <laughs> uh, from Stephen Butch. Um, what are what are your experiences of using subjective skills or measures with players for recovery, wellness, or training? Uh, so, so quite a lot. We use a lot of subjective skills. Um, we use subjective skills. In, in, I suppose in the minute to answer this question, but we use subjective skills a bit more than objective skills. A because they're easier for us to use with again the equipment that we currently have available to us. But they also seem to be quite sensitive. They're very sensitive sometimes more than objective skills are as well. Um, my experience of using them, so we we use them uh, in most multi-sport games now. So a lot of World University games and Commonwealth games, they're now used. And they're not only used uh, with uh, athletes, but they're also used with staff as well. Uh, because 
looking after staff wellness and, and, and mental health uh, is just as important as looking after the athlete side as well. Um, so experiences that we, we first year World University Games, we rolled it out was in Taipei, uh, where I was the, the deputy lead physio too, Stephen Much, who was the, the head physio, lead physio. Uh, and we used it with staff levels. Um, and then after using it, we kind of realised how 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 useful it was and how impactful it could be. And so then uh, he, Ren ran on and to be used at the next World University Games uh, in Napoli, uh, which I wasn't at, but he, but Stephen did. Uh, and then in Commonwealth Games, we also used it again as well. Um, and lots of teams will, will use them, lots of individual teams will use them as well. Um, and I think they're they're hugely useful. And I, and I think it's, it's just good practice now uh, to monitor player well-being and wellness. It just allows us to intervene when we think we need to intervene uh, and change things and address problems that we may see coming up as best we possibly can as well. Um, and yeah, and those subjective skills I stole from um, Alan McCall, <laughs> who'll be sitting with Stephen right now. Uh, and I robbed him from him with, with great thanks to him. <laughs> um, so um, Ali's asking about you how you communicate results of the well-being to the coaching staff for action? Uh, emailed. <laughs> so if I'm there, <laughs> then they get told. Uh, but in essence, we just so the so the app allows us to use a survey. In essence, a survey um, a survey uh, facility on the app, which then means that the players have it on their phone. Uh, so that we set it up so that if, when they wake up in the morning, the the survey is there to be filled out, and they'll get a reminder on their phone that they have to fill out the survey then and there. Uh, and so then they fill it out, the information comes back in, we then put it into uh, an Excel file, and then we can start to track it. Uh, we, we can vary that depending again on on you know if we think we've got an early morning match, we might set it up so it goes on earlier. I mean, we can vary it depending on um, uh, yeah if we want to give them a longer lie in and so on and so forth and we may change the time it goes out but otherwise it goes out to a standard time in the morning uh, so that if if somebody is really tired not sleeping well we can have a, a chat and potentially start to think about what do we do with them later in the day if somebody's muscle soreness scores are, are through the roof you know we need to work out what, you know what, what we can do and that's a nice thing about the, the, the tracking is, is allows that <coughs> if we do it over a long period of time it means we can also end up, we can we can highlight individuals. So we see certain individuals that consistently seem to be scoring high muscle soreness scores. As every competition is the same, high muscle soreness score. Then we might want to then individualise that by athlete and what we do then and there. But it also might want to then look at what, what you're doing throughout the year. You know, do you what is your diet like? Do we think you've got enough of the right things in there that might have an impact on how muscle your muscle soreness? Would you would you benefit from going and getting some sports massages throughout the year? Um, you know, and see would that bring down your level of muscle soreness? Should we be doing more massage with that athlete when we are in competition? Um, would that bring your scores down? And so again, we can in essence. Intervene. We can we can see we can we can test, intervene, and then test again, basically. Uh, we have another question from here. To what extent can your level of physical preparation dictate the speed quality of your recovery? Not just pre-match prep, but general performance, lifestyle habits. Yeah, hugely, hugely. I mean, ultimately, if what we want to say is we want the body to adapt, we train to adapt to get stronger and better. Well, it then means that when you then go and put yourself under a lot of stress in a competition phase, you you deal with it better. So your scores then are better. So it's a simple answer that the more conditioned, the better shape the athlete is in, the stronger they are, the more robust they are. You can't stop trauma events happening, but you you know you you your chances are that that athlete will. will be better at coping with recovery. If they also know what they do and works for them. And that's why, again, we mentioned very often experiment with these things. If an athlete is knows what works for them, has a really good routine around all these things, the chances are they'll be the one in game three who still looks amazing against the guy who or the girl who can't get off the bench because you know they, they can't get off the bench and the legs won't get them up. And um, so I think the key here is conditioning. Con conditioning will solve huge amounts of these problems. And this is where the challenge of working in recreational sport is. You know, working in recreational sport or sport where people maybe train only twice a week and then play a week, you know, is, is do they have time to do the conditioning stuff? 
because we know our athletes might don't maybe not have the time because they've got jobs, husbands, wives, um, kids don't have the time to do the gym work. All they've got time to do is play two the two training sessions a week. So again, recovery for us might be something we have to be very very good at because we need to get players through you know tight match congestion schedules um so again you know weirdly recovery well seen as being essential at the higher level is it also just as essential at the lower level as well to some extent yeah okay so we've got a couple more questions and then we'll let you get back to your family life <laughs> um is there any science to say compression helps during play so um uh, yes and no. Um, so people have done studies to look at see whether or not things like having compression on, say, an, an upper limb in volleyball um, impacts on accuracy. So proprioception around joints and things like that, where if you compress the joint and you take two joint surfaces, put them together, do you see an increase in the body's ability to pick up where the joint is? So would that maybe make you more accurate when you go to hit shots and balls? Um, there's a feeling that um, compression might have a role to play in muscle vibration. So when we exercise, muscle vibrates and moves. Um, and does that generate heat? And does that heat and does that then cost us energy? Um, so by reducing the amount the muscle moves around by using compression, does that have an impact? And would that make us you know, more energy efficient, reduce the heat the muscle generates? I mean, these, these studies exist. Are they, comp are they, is it, is it, uh, conclusive evidence, not not particularly. Um, again, the argument here would be try it. If if you if you do it and you see whether or not it has an impact, then then do it. I mean, it, it, if we're looking at um, some, I suppose to expand that idea. I mean, if we're talking about accuracy or improvement in accuracy, there's some nice studies. There's some studies that looked at um, the use of psychological interventions before serving practice in volleyball, where they looked at saying, okay, well, if you have imagery practice or you work practice on kind of uh, techniques that might reduce your stress levels or anxiety, if practicing them then improved a serving routine or a serving drill and, and accuracy within serving drills, and it, and again, there was a small impact upon those things as well. And so I would, again, I would argue, or not argue, but you would argue, you could say, well, do we spend time sticking compression on your arm in the hope that it might might make a difference to your accuracy? Or do you learn how to do some meditation, some mindfulness, some you know mental rehearsal exercises that then potentially have a better impact and also maybe have a wider impact on, on you as an individual, but also have a better impact on your overall recovery uh, as well as how you deal with stressful interventions or stressful times and moments within games, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So final question, uh, we're going to put you on the spot. It appears you've become very popular over the last 90 minutes. So have you got any... Um, room in your life to be working with any other national teams or to try and integrate a full national team program wide uh, plan. So I mean, ultimately that that, that is um, that is a plan. Is is the, we can start to think about having a role, um, or, or if it's not so much a role, is that we can start to make sure that we have science based and evidence based programs or protocols that we can follow as a, as a as a national as a governing body so that our, our men's team and our women's team can be doing in essence the same things um with maybe slight adaptations as we can be touched upon that our youth athletes are doing the right things for them so that again they are looking after themselves at their youth stage but they're also becoming again well-rounded athletes when they can step up to the next level um We've struggled before in the past when trying to how do we get that message out and how do we get that that put together in some sort of package. Uh, and the goal would be is that in the next six months, uh, hopefully that we will start to look at how that that can come together uh, and make use of the can you say for example the new the new website we have is does that allow us to put programs online? Does it allow all the national team coaches to get access to the same things? Um, so that we're just we're, we're doing good work you know work that we can in essence be proud of uh, and that has that has positive impact and performance um these little things they may be minor but you know they all come together to make a better performance uh, and again when we're dealing with a i suppose a minority sport uh with little funding and all the other challenges that go on you know these things are are, are easy wins and they should be they, they, they should be simple for us to do well, Kenny, I have to say a massive thank you uh, for joining us tonight. 
Um, again, thank you for taking your time out from uh, spending it with your family um, to give us this insight into the recovery methods. Um, I'm pretty sure everyone at home will um, confirm with me that this has been fantastic. It's been absolutely mind-blowing in terms of the information you're giving. And I think the fact that it's, we're looking for a consistent message um, across all our programmes as well is really important. It's great to hear that message come out from yourself as well. So from all of us at the SVA Online team, just want to say a massive thank you. And we look forward to working with you very soon. No worries. Thanks very much, everybody. Stay safe out there. So, guys, um, just to finish up um, this evening. Um, so that was, again, a fantastic presentation by Kenny. Some really good information. Um, we're moving on next Tuesday to a webinar and an online discussion with Kieran Nachara, who is the, if anyone knows Kieran Nachara, they know he's a Scottish basketball legend. Um, he's played in Europe um, very high level, uh, played at the Commonwealth Games, got the fourth place at the Commonwealth Games, played in Great Britain, was co-captain of Great Britain as well. So it's great just to have someone who's not from volleyball as well coming and speaking to us about this cross-sport working. So that will be next Tuesday at the 14th, um, same time, 7 o'clock to 8.30. So hopefully we'll see you then. Thanks. Good night, everyone.